raging, you know, um, how to be healthy. Um, and I think, you know, her role in the film was, in a sense, like to be a starry-eyed person, which she was. You know, she was all the hopes and the dreams. And um, the fact that she agreed to go and kind of be in that line to compete, you know, for the supermodel of the world, I think, you know, that was kind of like, we all came up with that idea. I think she was a good sport. I mean, I, it's beautiful in the film because you see the whole point of it, as far as I'm concerned, or one of the points of it is she's so much more beautiful than some of the biological women. And I, I think, you know, to know that trans women are women and, you know, uh, can stand next to biological women and that at, certainly in terms of, like, you're going to hire a model, <laughs> um, why not hire a woman who's a trans woman? Because look at her. She's as beautiful as so many of the models. And I think Octavia knew that about herself. And she was obviously ahead of her time because now there are trans women models who are, you know, getting the real work. It just wasn't happening then because of the discrimination and people weren't ready for it. Um, uh, but I really, you know, I honored her, her ambition. You know, her, she had a very, I don't know how to put this, like nice affect. You know, there's just something about her that was, that was, she could be fierce, but she could also be just like very delicate and, um, that generation of trans women really, really, really paved the way. Not that it's easy now <laughs> um, for young, young trans folk, but, but I mean, it was, it was harder then. And um, I don't know. I mean, I was very fortunate um, that Octavia and Venus wanted to talk to me and trusted me to portray their dreams and their struggles. What about Willie Ninja? Mm -hmm. He's internationally known. Yeah. Well, Willie was one of the first people I met um, because those voguing guys in the park were, like, talking about voguing. They mentioned his name from day one. I knew his name. They were like, if you want to know about, about um, you know, you want to know about voguing, go to see Willie. So Willie, um, at the time that I met him, he was walking bald. He also he had the ninjas. He also had a, a dance group called um, uh, Breed of Motion with Archie Burnett and some other people in it. And so I used to go with my friend Meg, who was the person who sort of said, oh, you know, you want to make a film, got to make a trailer, and maybe you should make a film. And we used to go hang out with Willie and his dance group in June Liberta Studio, which was in Midtown, and they'd be practicing dancing, practicing their dance moves. Um, Willie lived in Queens with his... When I met him, he was working at a health food store, um, in Fifth Avenue, in the 666 Fifth Avenue building. He lived um, with his mom, who at the time, she was disabled, and she worked with disabled people. So she was like very, very strong woman, strong mom figure. They had an amazing relationship. Her mom, his mom was like so accepting of his queerness and just like, whatever you do, son, you just got to have a job, you know, and very encouraging. And I think the encouragement he had from his mother, you know, really drove him in terms of his ambition. He was very lucky that he had such an encouraging parent. And also he worked so hard as a dancer, always practicing, always rehearsing, always learning his moves. He had natural double joints, you know, which helped him evolve that style that he had of voguing. Um, but he was really, really sweet man, very easy to get along with. Um, very sweet to people. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, we all have our shady sides, but he he was just very kind and really saw the best in people. He's another person who, you know, he died in the summer of um, 2006. And that summer I was living in Massachusetts, and I came back to see him in the hospital in Queens, and I just, again, it's like, just you don't expect, you know how that is. Well, sometimes you lose a person and you don't expect to lose them. And I was kind of sad and kind of angry. I just felt like Willie needed to be here to keep teaching the kids and keep dancing and keep, keep, keep choreographing. I really miss him a lot. I mean, I really wish he could be there on Friday, you know. I just, he should be there on Friday. And I, I think he'll be looking down. But I really, um, 
what a talented dancer and choreographer and so ambitious, you know, and he achieved this ambition. He wanted to go to Japan. He wanted to go to France. He wanted to be in fashion shows, and he did it and, you know, was respected. Um, and he, I don't, he knew, and the other thing I just want to say, he knew so much about dance, and, you know, he'd be watching all these videos and talking about what the dance moves were, and I learned a lot from watching him watch things you know, because he studied them very carefully and deconstructed them and thought about, you know, what people were doing in terms of dancing and choreographing and how he would apply that knowledge to his own dancing and choreographing. Really hard, hard, hard worker, talented, talented uh, dancer. Wow, amazing. He was amazing. He was amazing. Let's talk a little bit about Paris Capri. So Paris Dupree um, was an entertainer, was the mother of the house of Dupree. Um, I remember oh, going to see him. This would have been in 1985 in a club. I do not remember which club. It could have been Sally's, but I think it might have been Sally's Hideaway. It might have been another club. And he would do lip syncing. So he would be in the feathers and the beads, lip syncing, and I remember him lip syncing to, there was this song called Beyond Thunderdome, We Don't Need Another Hero. You know, you, some people will know that song. And he was lip syncing that song. And I remember thinking, you know, I didn't have any money to shoot at that time. You know, in this day and age, you'd have your little video camera and you would have sh- shot it. But, you know, no such thing existed. Right. And I just remember thinking, oh, I'm so upset. I don't have a film crew. Because just watching him perform was so great. And it just made me think, oh, I want to make this song so bad. Really good performer. He also would sometimes do, pardon me, this act where he would, uh, he would, and, and I'm sure anybody who's seen drag has seen various people do this, he would take the drag off, you know, while he was doing it. So he'd be in Deeds and, Deeds and Feathers, and then he'd, like, pull off the wig, and, you know, ha- he'd have the, um, you know, the kind of stocking around his hair, and, and then he'd, like, pull off the dress, and he was a guy. And he did, I saw him do that once, and that was a good act. I and mean, he does a little tiny version of that in Paris is Burning where he's saying Butch, Butch Queens and he pulls off the wig. But um, he's a wonderful performer, mother of the house. I actually um, interviewed him. One of my very first film shoots was interviewing him. But then he changed his mind and said, I don't, I don't really want you to use the interview, um, but you can use the ball footage of me. And so I didn't use the interview and I did use the ball footage of him. He obviously was a legend. Um, the Paris is Burning Ball, which was his ball. I don't remember which part, seven or something like that, maybe his seventh ball, something like that, um, was the first ball I ever shot um, on February 23rd, um, 1985. And it was it was up in the Elk Lodge, and, you know, it was a great ball with so many categories. And we, we had to light it because back in the day, the film stocks weren't so weren't so good in dark places and so we, we had a lot of lights and we shot that ball and a lot of the footage in the film is from that ball um he was a, you know those those balls that that he gave were fantastic balls and i think i think that was just his ball but also i think he and dorian would give balls together as well wow amazing that's iconic iconic L- let's really talk a was... little bit about junior labasia because okay. I know he comes out in the film as well. Uh, Junior LaBeja is, you know, I always used to say, and, you know, you could make up your own uh, body parts for, for, e- for each person who's in the film, but I always used to say that Dorian Corey is the heart of the film and Junior LaBeja is the brain of the film. Um, Junior is another person that you don't see him interviewed because he said he'd do it and then he changed his mind when we were shooting and then when we were done, I said, okay, you didn't want to be filmed can I use your ball stuff and can I use your audio interviews? Because I had gone to his house to do a long, long audio interview. He said, oh, that's fine. You can use it. And so he's the one who says, you know, this is white America, you know, that that um, sort of riff paragraph that happens when um, it's a ball that was shot in a gym in Brooklyn where you see this guy walking military and um, beautiful, beautiful passage. So, you know, Junior was like, from 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 the time I sorry quickly from the time I first met him, you know, really brilliant, kind of a genius in terms of how he speaks and how he puts ideas together. You know, really really interesting mind. And so when I was interviewing him, 
doing this audio interview, I was very excited because he just had a lot of ideas that I thought were very relevant to what stories I wanted the film to tell. So, um, yeah, so when I met him, he, like I said, I met with him, we recorded all this stuff. As the ball announcer, he was endlessly clever, endlessly energetic, funny, you know, as he would say himself, he's, you know, not shady, just fierce, though he could be shady. But he, as a ball announcer, he really wasn't shady, and he did have this aspect to him that, that really did sound, and probably does still, you know, sound like a bit like church rhetoric. He sometimes would bring it back to, like, really what matters. Like, like I'm telling you that, that um, the eulogy that he gave for Margot Princess, you know, the whole point of it was, let's come together. We're in crisis. We need to come together, people. We need to work together. And so I felt that that, that was something he really... He really thought about the deeper values and the deeper meaning of what was going on in a very brilliant way. And, of course, you know, the clever moments in the film like O-P-U-L-E-N-C-E, opulence, you own everything, everything is yours, you know, commenting on um, the people walking, yachting where. Um, you know, he's a very, very important. And, you know, he and Dorian, like I said, I mean, Pepper is sort of, has Pepper's own thing and is very wise and funny, but he and Dorian are kind of like, I think they were like the lead, the lead commentators, and I think without them, well, without Pepper too, I mean, I don't even want to make it a competition, without the older generation, I think it wouldn't be the film it is, because they had the perspective and the wisdom and the knowledge, and, you know, Junior, he just just has a really interesting mind and you know being the sort of book nerd that I am I was very drawn to people who could you know wasn't just going to be about performance it wasn't just going to be about surfaces it was going to be about the depth of the ball world which obviously you know is there wow let's let's talk a little bit about David Altima I'm sorry Let's talk a little bit about David Ultima. Um, do you mean um, David Extravaganza? The father, David Extravaganza. The formerly the father of Extravaganza. Yes. So, I, you know, he has his moment, which is basically the fur coat scene, right, um, right, the fur right. coat controversy, which, um, I mean, it's a, you know, I mean, it's like Dorian says that. People become a stickler for exact exact interpretations, and I think you know that moment is iconic in terms of. And we 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 showed a few more after that in terms of just showing that like it's a competition. People will get you for what they can get you for. Was it a man's coat? Was it a woman's coat? I certainly don't know to this day. But I think the fact that it becomes an issue and there's angry anger and there's controversy and there's people shocking people, you know, I hope to this day he doesn't feel that that moment is at his expense because I think it was ex exceedingly typical, you know, that something would happen and people start yelling. And as Dorian points out, that happens with the Olympics, that happens in elections, <laughs> presidential elections. Yeah. You know, this is not just saying... People yell at each other in the ball world. They yell at each other everywhere. But right. in the ball world, they yell at each other about the gender of the code. In the election, they yell at each about, you know, who deserved to become the president and how many votes we have to count. So, um, so you know, he obviously was a figure. He was around. There's another shot of him shooting some video footage at one of the balls. Um, he wasn't somebody that I interviewed um, because no reason, really. I think at the time I was closer to Danny and Venus. And, you know, some of the, the younger folk at that time, um, he's an important part of the film. Right, right. All right. Um, was he removed from the original cover? I mean, was he only in the original cover? or? No, not at all. I mean, I didn't, um, nobody was removed from anything. I mean, the, the, the film shoot, which was organized by, I mean, the, the poster shoot, which was organized by... Um, uh, Miramax, it was a, a photographer named Michelle Combs. Um, I mean, when I did my poster for Sundance, the picture I used was this picture I had taken of Venus. I don't